Begin the current daf Masech the Shabbos daf Lamed Vav. We begin on the bottom of Lamed Hey and Beis. Two lines up in the bottom of the Yamud. Where the Gemara continues the discussion of the previous daf. Asher is co-sponsored by Kalzuch and Yecheskel. Torah anytime. Daf Achaim. We thank everybody joining us again on Zoom. Some of the ideas we're going to be speaking about, some interesting halachic, uh, practical to Hilchas Shabbos, is we're going to just be continuing first regarding the case that we mentioned in the previous daf. Whether a shaper is mukta on Shabbos, one of the Critical halachas relating to mukta is regarding a klisha malach isr. A vessel that's used primarily for something prohibited, like a hammer. Is that something mukta? Can you not move it at all? And we'll talk about some of the principles. The primary will be on a different daf, or what's called the tzarech gufoy, or mukaymoy, for the, for the utility of the thing itself, or for its place that's taken up. Is that mukta? Then we're going to start the third parak, parakira which is discussing primarily the laws of Bishel B'Shabbos, cooking on Shabbos, and the Yisru that are associated with Bishel, which is what we're going to start off with regarding Shehiya, keeping something on the oven, Chazara, putting it back on Shabbos, and Hatmana, which we had already mentioned previously, and the later prayer is going to talk about regarding insulating something uh, as it relates to Shabbos. Now, what is Shehiya? Shia is, from the word Shia means to delay, it means to leave food cooking on a fire from before Shabbos. That's all it is. Just leaving food on. So it's Friday, you're putting the pot of food on the kira from before Shabbos. That is the halacha that we're going to discuss regarding if that's permitted or not and what's the, the parameters. Then there's halacha known as chazara. So on Shabbos Kaidish, are you allowed to return or put food in an oven on Shabbos? So it's on Shabbos. It was already on the fire. You took it off. Are you allowed to put it back on the fire? Now, what are some of the concerns are? Shemi yichata. The concern is, is if we let you do one of these things, that you might come to stoke the coals and be over the Isidai Raisa of Havara. If you if we can let you keep this stuff on, because if it's not fully cooked, as we'll see, it depends if it's fully cooked or maybe partially cooked, you might come to stoke the coals, but thus violating this the rest of Avar. Additionally, the concern is Merzi Kemavashal. It looks like an act of cooking, if one goes and one puts it back onto the fire, it looks like you're cooking. So the concern for Shehiya is Shemichata. The concern for Chazara, putting it back on, it looks like you're cooking. Now, there's going to be two primary ways that we talk about. This is where the concept known as a blech comes from. There's something called grufa and ketuma. Grufa literally means, say, shoveling out the coals. If you shovel out the coals, there's no Shemichata. There's nothing to go ahead and shovel around. So therefore, that would be one permissible way of getting around the problem of Shehiya. And additionally, there's something called ketuma. Ketuma is really, and the concept of, of a blech is very much related to that of ketuma. Ketuma literally means ashes. If you cover the coals with ashes, so then you're obviously showing that you're not intending to be machata, to make the flames higher, because I'm diminishing the flame. So A, it's going to be a reminder, because I'm like, hey, why are there ashes on the thing? Oh, it's Shabbos, right? We're not going to do this. And additionally, it's lowering the heat. That's exactly what a blech does. That's the different, uh, different halach. It's related to a blech. Some say it has to cover the knobs or just enough to cover the fire. And that's the purpose is because it's, it's aids. It diminishes the heat, as a blech is obviously diminishing the heat, a fat piece of, of metal. Uh, and, and additionally, uh, it, it also is, is, it serves as a reminder. Now, what's important to just understand, for Talmudic times, there was these three types of ovens. Now, our paragraph is called parakir that we're going to start shortly. There's, but there's three types of ovens that they had. There's a tanner, which it, it, was, it was narrow, and it had room for one pot, and hence that increased the heat. Then there was kira, which is what we were discussing about regarding that it, had, it was wider and it had room for two pots. And then there was something called kupach, which in the middle, which had more heat than the kira, but less heat than the tanner, because it wasn't as narrowing as the tanner, but it wasn't as wide as the kira, it was the same, the same shape as the kira, but it only had space for one pot. Additionally, a very important concept that's going to come up in our daf and also further in these daf are what's called Michael ben Drusoy. Ben Drusoy was a bandit, and he was on the run. He didn't get a chance to really cook up his food, so he would cook it to only 33%, a third of it, Machlik is Rashi, Rambam famous, Rambam says 50%, but Rashi says a third of it, he was only, you know, just put it on the, I, I, you know, the food on the fire, it gets a little bit roasted, it's good enough, it's as long as it's not raw, and he would eat it, that's what's known as the Michael ben Jusai. we'll see that as that relates to the laws of Shabbos. So we begin the current daft of Lamahim Beis, 
Two lines up in the bottom of the Yomid. We were directly in the middle of the previous Gemara's discussion. We had mentioned regarding the six shoifa blasts that they would make on Arab Shabbos to, to tell people Shabbos is coming, stop doing malacha. Now we said, oh, after the last blast, you can still light your Shabbos candles because the guy who blew the shoifa, he's got to take home the shoifa. Obviously, they give him a little time before Shabbos starts. And the Gemara says, no. Because rather Allah is a person not allowed to move a shayfer and not allowed to use a uh, move a So what did he do? The guy who blew the shayfer, he put it right there on the roof, and Shabbos started right after. On that halach, the Gemara asks that you telling me that the shayfer that he blew with is mukta, and therefore Shabbos starts right away. He couldn't move it; he put it right down over there. But the, the Gemara is going to ask, as one can see from the slide, this is the Gemara's answer. There's going to be three different seemingly opinions on this halacha. So the Gemara from the previous stuff had said, No, not let him move a shayfer, not, not let him move a trumpet, they're all mukt. And that is the Gemara, but Vatanya in the Brice that says, Shayfer mitaltel, you let him move a shayfer on Shabbos. The reason for that is, is because a shayfer, the, the shape of the shayfer, a ram's horn, is bent. So you, it has utility, it could be used, uh, the, the discussion is if that's called klisha malach lehetter, it could be used to drool water. And you could give a child to drink with it. So therefore, that's not moktza. Now, is, but the trumpet, well, it's not exactly necessarily the trumpet that we see here in the picture, but a trumpet is, it, it, well, it could be, a trumpet is uh, flat, meaning it's, it's, it, it's, it doesn't have a receptacle. You can't use a trumpet to give a child to drink. So this is what's a very important concept so we'll talk about later on this Mesechta. What's called Dabr Shemalach de Le'isr. A, a vessel that's used primarily for something for, prohibited, where here the trumpet is used, a trumpet you're not allowed to play on Shabbos because it's, it, it, you might come to fix the, 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 the instrument that you're playing on Shabbos. So, so it's a kli it's, that's used for something for prohibited and because it, it doesn't have a heter thing like a shafer, so therefore it's prohibited as mukta, so therefore in the matali and I'll move it. So one thing is, you told me on the previous stuff, the line before, that the Chazan HaKnesses, who was blowing the Shamash, who was blowing the, the Shafer, he had to drop it like a hot cake because it's Mukta, right? Shabbos starting. What do you mean? We see that a Shafer, you're allowed to move. It's not Mukta. So what are you saying that, that he had to drop it? A, 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 a trumpet is Mukta, not a Shafer. So Rabbi Yisif, he says, look, it's not difficult. Khan biyachin. And for an individual, Shafer is not Mukta. Khan bitzibur. But the Chazan HaKnesses, he was doing it for the public, for him, a shayfer is mukta because he, he, for him, the shayfer was, was designated just for blowing, which you're not allowed to play an instrument on Shabbos. So for him, it's mukta. That I'm like, Abai, Abai wonders on this. He says, I don't understand. What do you tell me? Why for an individual? You tell me a shayfer is not mukta? Because like we explained in, 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 as in our previous discussion, we said, because you're allowed to go ahead and, and feed a child water with the shayfer. You could use it to draw as a tool and you could give the child to drink with the shayfer. So therefore it's considered klisha malach de lehetter. And therefore, it's not mukta, because it has a permitted u- utility of Shabbos purposes. You're not saying, oh, I'm never going to use this. Shabbos, you might need to use a receptacle. You might use a shayfer. So then the question is, why, if the, if the chazan HaKnes says, why is the shayfer of him mukta, even if it's the public's, sometimes you have to use the public funds, the public utilities for paupers. For a child that's a pauper, the, the, it's incumbent upon the tzibur to support him. So therefore, the shayfer of the tzibur also should not be mukta, because they might need to give a, a child to drink. That's one question. But anyway, the Gemara says another question that's going to throw open this sugya and the whole understanding. But Sue, another question is Hadatanya. We have a Bryce says a third opinion. The Bryce says, Kishem Shemataltanus Vashabit, just like you let him move a shafer, Kagmataltanus Achatzait says, you let him move even a trumpet. So the Gemara says, I don't understand. Mani, who is this? Why isn't it Mukta? You told me a trumpet is, is, is Mukta because it's, it's a Klisha Malachtila Isser. It's used for prohibited activity. It doesn't even have a heter utility. Why is that going to be permitted? So Ella rather, and this is what this slide is showing, like Kasha, it's not difficult. And it's not like the way Rabbi Yisrael said. Rather, these three different opinions are three different Tanoic opinions in the laws of Muktzah. So here's where you get a snapshot opening up this, halo, this, this sugi of Muktzah. Ha, this that it said, as we brought previously, that the shayfer could be moved, but the trumpets cannot be moved, which was the first brace we brought. That's Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda holds of the laws of Muktzah. And therefore, that what happens is that the, the trumpet we said cannot be moved because it doesn't have any real heter utility. Only a little bit. But therefore, you have it totally out of sight, out of mind, because 
it's not really used for gen- you could use it for something permissible on Shabbos. You could decide to use it to, to, to scratch your ear, whatever it is. But but that's not considered a dovish lahat. It's considered what's called dovish malachla is it's primarily used for something for prohibited. That's what trumpets are. So it's gonna be muktzah. Now, but a shaifer, that like we said, is a kli, because you could use it to give a child to drink. So therefore, that opinion that says that a trumpet is mukta is because a klisham lachtel is. It's used for something prohibited. But a shaiva is not mukta because it could be used to hold water. So that's, that's called the klisham lachtel lehat. Ha, oh, the Bryce that said that both of them can be moved, which is what we, that, what we just said right now, the last uh, Bryce we quoted, that's Rib Shimon. He does not hold of the halachas, the laws of mukta. Meaning, when the, we, just to understand this, we're going to be using this word a lot in this whole masechta. He doesn't hold the mukta. What we mean to say is, he doesn't hold to the expansive definition of mukta. But for example, let's say mukta mach and kiss. That's something that, don't touch, because it's going to get ruined. That's called mukta. It's, you're not allowed to touch it because of chesar and kiss, it might get ruined. Now, but as Taisa points out, which Allah lamaisim, although Rib Shimon allows you to move things like the trumpet and the shaifer, but it's only what's called letzer gufo or mekayme that's permitted. What's letzer gufo? Gufo is you want to use it for something. So I want to use the shafer to drink water with it. I want to use the trumpet to smash some nuts. So that you're allowed to do it. But what's called mecham letzel, and again we'll talk about this on, on, on later dafim, later on the mesechta, but if you want to you just move it that it shouldn't get ruined from the shade to the, to the, from the sun to the shade, Rav Shem would agree that that's going to be prohibited. But here we're talking about that you want to use it for something. So Rib Shimon says, he's the Bryce that we just mentioned before that says, no, the trumpet and the shaifer are not muksa, because he doesn't hold the muksa. He doesn't hold well, what, what muksa. I could use it for, for cracking nuts or whatever this and that. He only holds something that's really extreme, like muksa machmas chasan kiss, that he holds going to be considered muksa. And ha, oh, the Bryce, that the, the halacha that we mentioned in the previous daf, that we said, no, even the chazana kinesis, a shaifer cannot be moved. Who is that? That's from Nechemia. That he says, even a knife, even a, a cloak, even a shirt, you cannot move unless it's for its designated utility. That's what Rashi says. Taisa brings Rabbein Tam that says a little different. Says Reb Nechemia only permits you to use something that you would normally use it for in the weekday, even if it's not its designated utility. Now, therefore, even a davish malachta leisser Reb Nechemia hold would be permitted if you're using it the way it's normally used during the weekday. So, for example, like a hammer to crack open nuts or some type of a, a hatchet that used to cut to cut open the the dried figs. Since that's the normal way that's used during the weekday, so therefore that's going to be permitted, even though that's a klishon lach le iser, and oh, for sure that he should hold its aser. No, if you're using it for its normal way it's used during the weekday, then it's okay, but if it's not, then you can't. So therefore he held, even the shayf is mukta, because the shayf is not usually used to draw water. You don't usually use it, you use it to blow, to, to, to make blasts. So therefore, explains the Gemara, we have resolved the contradiction because these three different interpretations are three different Tanoic interpretations in the laws of Muktzah. Rabbi Yehuda, who holds the more expansive interpretation of Muktzah, holds, yeah, a trumpet is Klisha Nachlet, says Aser. Shaifer is considered Klisha Nachlet, the way Rashi says it. Rabbi Shimon says, no, both are not Muktzah because it doesn't really hold of Muktzah. Only if it's really extremely that no one, you really don't go near it because it's Machmas Chasar and Kiss, that what he would be considered as Muktzah. And Nechemi holds that, no, actually both are Muktzah because everything's mukta, even, even something like a talus is mukta, unless you're using it for a, what it's meant for, a knife. If you're using it for something else, no, you can't just move a knife. A knife has to be used for cutting. And therefore, a shreif is going to be mukta because you can't use it to blow blast on Shabbos. And to say you're going to use it for water, that's not a designated purpose. Then it's going to be mukta. Now, the Gemara just points out something interesting that umayt shreifer. So what's the shreifer that we said? This was the Bryce that started off the discussion with the previous daf. That we said, So you're telling me that you can't blow a shayfer on Shabbos, you can't move a shayfer on Shabbos, and you can't move a, a, a trumpet on Shabbos. Now the difficulty is, if you're already telling me you can't move a shayfer on Shabbos, why do you have to tell me you can't move a trumpet? It's a culture game. It, it, because a trumpet, it can't be used to give a child water to drink. The other opinion said that a shayfer is not mukta. Mechemi says, no, both the trumpet and the shayf is mukta. Now, but the wording that was said on the previous stuff, we didn't quote it, it was the line before from the previous stuff, said, no, you, you can't move a shayf and you can't move a chatzaitzis. But if you're saying you can't move a shayf, of course you can't move a chatzaitzis. So the Gemara explains something that's going to introduce us to the next sugya. Umay shayf, what did he mean when he said the word shayf? Nami chatzaitzis. He really means the, the trumpet. And when it's said in the shayf that you can't move a trumpet, it's really the shayf. What does that mean? Because the names were changed. As the Gemara brings, that Kid Rav Chizda. The Rav Chizda says, Hani Tlas Mili, the following three things. Ishtani Shemayu. Their names were changed. Michichar of Beis 
Interestingly, when the base of Mikdash was destroyed, the, 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 the names of certain things changed to be the exact opposite of what it is. Meaning, Chatzaitzra, what was once called trumpets, is actually now called Shaifar, it's called the Shaifar. And Shaifar, what was once called Shaifar, the Shaifar, is actually Chatzaitzra, it's actually now called Chatzaitzra. So, you're right, if I'm telling you you can't move on Shabbos a Shaifar, you most definitely cannot move a trumpet. But actually, when he said Shaifar, it meant the trumpet. And when he said trumpet, he meant the shayfer, because actually the words were changed around. So although he used the word shayfer, it really means chadzaitzus. So yeah, so then it's saying in the, in the way of a chiddush. Not only can you not move a trumpet, you can't even move a shayfer. So the Gemara says, Lamai nafkmi, what's the halachic relevancy of this teaching of Rav Chizda to say, oh, that they changed the name? Okay, so they changed the name, who cares? It says, the Gemara, l'shev ishal Rosh Hashanah. The nafkmina is, the relevancy is, the halachic takeaway is for Rosh Hashanah. You're only allowed to blow with the one that the people call chadzaitzus. Because what people call chadzaitzus is really the shayfer. Or, uh, or a similar uh, ramification would be if, let's say, an Amma Aretz comes to ask, what should I blow with? And you tell him, blow with the Chatzaitzis. Blow with the Chatzaitzis, plus blow with the Shafer. Yes, but the people call the Shafer Chatzaitzis, and they call the Chatzaitzis a Shafer. So when he's asking what you should blow with, tell him to blow with a Chatzaitzis, because then he'll blow with the right one, which is the Shafer. Similarly, the second thing that suddenly changed names after the Churban Mesa Migdash was Arava, the willow, they called, suddenly started calling it Tzavtzafa. And what was, what they called, what was Tzavtzafa, they started calling Arava. So it's the I mean, what's the difference? It's the Lulav. It's for the Allah of Lulav, for Dal Minim. The real Tzavtzafa is invalid to be used for the Dal Minim of Lulav. Because its leaf is round, its stem is white, as the Gemara says in Sukkah, which is not the way it's supposed to be, for the Arava, which is supposed to be elongated and, and, has, and, and, and its, its stem is not supposed to be white. So, therefore, that's important to know, really, although people are calling that Arava, it's really the Tzavtzafa. What they call Tzavtzafa is the real Arava. Now, what's the third thing that changed name? Was Pesaira suddenly be called, started to be called Pesarta, and was originally Pesarta started to be called Pesaira. It's for business, because originally they called a large table Pesaira, and the small one was Pesarta, and now they changed it around. So if someone's selling you Pesarta, Pesarta, you have to know that now it's only the words were changed, and therefore to know what he's going to deliver, and therefore regarding the ramification of the business deal, is, is, is that they changed the name of what it really means. So too, says the Gemara, Amar Bay, it says, Af anu we could say a fourth thing that we could add onto the list of Chizda to say that here it also changed. Now, just important to point out, that there's, when we're discussing a kosher animal, which are called the ruminants, there's four stomachs that there are. So there's the first one, which is called the rumen, or, or it's called the keres, which is known as the paunch. It's, this is where the stomach that it begins, so if you see this, it comes into the mouth, it goes through the esophagus, and it comes here into the, the first stomach, the rumen, which is the paunch. That's really where the food start to de- begins to, to decay. Then, as you can see, it goes back. It's, it's called like it, it regurgitates. It goes back into, uh, it, it goes into the second stomach, which is known as the reticulum. The reticulum is the basakosis. This is going to be important to know the Hebrew words over here, which that's where it gets softened into cuds. We know it's called chewing your cud. It gets softened in, into cuds. And then after the second stomach, as you can see in the picture, I think there's a very good picture we got over here, in the second stomach, it goes back into the mouth. So after the second stomach, it goes into the mouth and it, it, it chews it again, chews its cut. Then it goes back and now it goes into the third stomach, which is known as the hemsis. This is the omasum, and that's where it dissolves. Then after the third stomach, as you can see, it goes through and it goes into the obamasum, which is the, known as the cava, which is the maw, that's... Uh, that's where, that goes in the fourth stomach, and then you can see it goes through, and then that's where it, intestines, and, and then it, 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 whatever goes into the animal gets digested, and whatever not goes out from the intestines. So that's how uh, a kosher animal, like a cow, is, 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 is the fourth stomach of, of the kosher cow. So, so Serabaya, we could say also, what was originally called Huvlila was changed to be called Bekasi. What was originally called Bekasi was changed to Huvlila. So essentially what that means to say is what... Uh, what they originally had called the hemsis, which was the third stomach, uh, they changed to hu- huvlila, which is really the second stomach, the reticulum. And what was called besakosis now suddenly changed. Like we said, the hemsis is the omosum, is the third stomach. That's the one near 
the base hakaisis, it's right near here, right near the reticulum, which actually, interestingly, although it's right near it, it doesn't come from there. As we said, from the reticulum, it goes back into the mouth and then comes back over here. But it's made like a round shape, like a circle, and inside is many different folds, like, uh, like, the, like the wheel of a, of a mill. And the, the walls are of this are very thin. So, says, says, says Abaya, they, they change the names of the second and the third stomachs. So what was originally called one, ended up being called the other one. So says the Gemara, what's the halakha relevancy for the, for the second and the third stomach? What, what is it that it's, what we're calling it that we're changing the names? Oh, says the Gemara, has a very halachic relevancy. Lamacha to a needle shenimtzis ba'ibi, it was found in the thick part of the wall of the base hakaisis, which we said that the, the base hakaisis is the end of the paunch. So if you see the rumen, a very large area of the animal's stomach, the end of it is this reticulum. So the end of the paunch, which is the first stomach, is there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, 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 a thick part over here, and inside it's made like a cup. And the thickness of the wall, the wall is doubled in the reticulum. And the walls are connected one to the other with fat. So if you find a needle in the thick part of the wall of the base hakaisis of the reticulum, if the mitzad echad, if you find the needle in the stomach of the animal on one side, meaning it did not puncture throughout both walls, then kshera, then the animal is going to be kosher because it's not a trefa. It could survive because the other wall is closing it up. But if it's a Mishnei Tzedatin, but if it's from both sides, meaning it went punctured all the way through, so then Trey the animal is going to be a, has a mortal defect, because obviously it cannot function anymore in the digestive system, and therefore it's a trefa. Now, that's what Abai is pointing out. It's important to know that we change the names, because the base cases, the reticulum, that is where you could differentiate between if it punctured one side or two sides. But by the hemses, by the omasum, the third stomach, even if you see the needle on one side where you don't see the puncture on the other side, that's not going to be considered as closed up because there's a very thin wall. So if the needle's on one side, it's important to understand which stomach are we talking about. Here one side's going to be kosher, here one side's going to be treif, as if you have to understand that the names were changed. Like we said, that what was originally called Be- Hovlila was started to be called Bekaisi, what was Hovlali became Bekaisi, and therefore it's important to know which stomach you're talking about regarding the laws of treifas. Now, Hamar um, Ravashi, he says, Afanunayim, we could also say a fifth thing that, some, that w- was changed the name. What was originally Bavl was suddenly called Bursif, and what was called Bursif suddenly became called Bavl. So as you continue to midbay, it says, I mean, what's Allah's relevancy, what it's called? So the difference is, Legite Nashim, for the divorce documents of women, which there's two interpretations in Rashi, either because we know, anyone who learns Masech Git knows that those in Bavl are Bekiyan, they know that you have to write the get, the divorce document, Lishma, for this woman. You can't just write generics and use it, oh, it's, it's, it's Shmuel and, 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 and and some type of uh, Miriam. No, so, so someone that brings a get from Bubble does not have to say, in front of me, it was written, in front of me, it was signed, because we know that they know the halachas, but people from other lands are not proficient, they have to say, in front of me, it was written, in front of me, it was signed, and I know, and I saw that it was written Lishma. But now that the people of Bursiv is really Bavl, and Bavl is really Bursiv, now in Bursiv, they were ignoramuses, as the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, the reason why they're called Bursiv is Bar Shafi, it's like an emptied out pit, that the water was taken out. So you have to know what they call Bursiv now is really Bavl, and that's the place you don't have to Bavl, which is, is, is actually Bursiv, so therefore you would have to know it, which is the real Bavl, that they don't have to say Bavl Nechta, but the other one they have to. Second interpretation Rashi says, no, the relevancy for Gidi Nashim is very simple, on the Get, you have to write the name of the city. And if you write the wrong name of the city, if you change his name or her name of the city, it's going to be invalid. And then you have to write what it's called now. Which Tyson brings from the Rajba that doesn't like that interpretation because Bubble is the name of a country, not the name of a city. And if they don't write the name of a country, and therefore he says not. Nah, but either way, that's the relevancy of Gidi Nashim to know which was the real Bubble. Says the Gemara, Hadnolach Bamem Malikin, which I return to the second paragraph, the second Shabbos paragraph Bamem Malikin, which has the title of the paragraph primarily spoke about the laws of lighting the Shabbos candles, what you could, what you can't, and the laws of Arab Shabbos. And with that, we continue on to again continue the theme Tasis said in the beginning of the Masech, but going through the order of Shabbos. We're still really in Arab Shabbos mode over here because we're going to talk about the halacha of Shehia, of putting stuff on from before Shabbos. So we continue with the third paragraph, Parakira, which 
it talks about the halachas of Bishal, of cooking on Shabbos, which is one of the malachas, and also rabbinic related gezeris of shahiyah, leaving something on the stove from before Shabbos that wasn't fully cooked, and regarding Chazar, about putting something back on the fire. So the Mishnah begins. And the halacha is, is like this Mishnah it says, Kira, the stove, which we, we spoke about in the introduction, that it's a stove that has room for two pots, as we'll see later, Mishnah said it, it makes a difference what type of oven we're talking about. So, so a rectangular stove that's made, has the shapes of a pot, and, and the actual oven itself is like a large pot, where they would, put, they would put food inside, they would put food on the top of it. So regarding this, this, this stove that was heated up, depends on what it was heated up with. If it was bekash with straw or begavava, or kash is the upper part of the stalk. That, as you can see, that's the end of the stalk, which we took out the kernels of grain already, so what are we going to do with it? So it could be used as fuel. And begavva is that which is, like Rashi says, the French word stubble, which is really what it is. It's the, it's the remnants that are attached from the ground. That's the lower part of the, of the stalk. Tyson's comments on that, which one it is which, but we're talking about straw and stubble. If you heat up the fire from those types of things, then nice and little top straw you could put on the cooked dish from before Shabbos, and we're not concerned. Why? Because there's no shemiyachat over here, because these things are, are flammable, they blow up in a second. So you're not going to come to like, it's not something as we're going to see in the next case, it makes coals that you have to stoke and rake the coals. These are very flammable, therefore there's no concern about you're going to do anything. Whatever it's going to take its course, it's going to take its course. Now we'll actually see in the Gemara, this halacha of Naisim Le Tavshel, what does this talk about? Is this talk about that you're allowed to put on Arab Shabbos, which called Shahir? Or is it actually talking about that you could even put it back, back on Shabbos, which called Chazar? But be that as it may, when it's heated with straw and stubble, you're allowed to put the food on it. Now, but let's say it's Begefes what's called mark, well, essentially what it is, it's the refuse, it's the leftovers of sesame seeds that you already took out the oil, and now you have like this, the, the leftovers, you know, to kvetch the you know, sesame seeds, or be'etzim, them, or let's say with wood, then lo'yitin, then you're not allowed to put on the food, ad she'yigreif, until you first shovel out the coals. You got to take it out, you can't leave the food on Shabbos with the coals in there. Why? Because, and this is Rashi's interpretation, takes comments on this, but Rashi compares it to the, like, the halacha of Hatmana. Because if you're going to leave inside the coals, it's Meisav Hebel, it's increasing heat. And as we said in the previous uh, daf, on daf Lama Dalit, in the previous parak, that you might be Mechata Begachal. You might, if you have something here that, that's increasing the heat, and, and it's, 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 it's coals that you could rake and it'll increase the heat, we're concerned you might do that. Therefore, you're only allowed to leave on the food from before Shabbos, only if either you shovel out the coals, or if you put ashes on top of the coals, which as Rashi says, that accomplishes two things. First of all, it covers it, so that's like a sign. And second of all, it also cools it down. So obviously I'm not going to come to heat it up if I'm coming to cool it down. So therefore, those would be two ways that I'm allowed to do what's called shahia. I'm allowed to leave the food on from before Shabbos. Either that I did grufa, and we'll see it's called in the Gemara ketuma, which is another word for ashes, and that's what's commonly known as grufa ketuma which that's where the custom of our, where our blech comes from. And this is the halach lamaisa. If you put on the blech, which is like the ashes, you're covering over the flame, then you're allowed to do shahi, you're allowed to leave the food on from before Shabbos. Now, b'shamerim, however, they, there's a machlik, is exactly what exactly, what type of foods are you allowed to leave on the fire? They say you're allowed to put on chamen, only hot water. That you're allowed to, after you already did the grufa, meaning you, you, you're not allowed to do anything without grufa ketuma. But if, let's say, you already shoveled out the coals, now this, this is hot water doesn't need to cook anymore. There, it doesn't really apply, as Taisa discusses, of Shem Yechata, because water doesn't get better the more that it cooks. It's already heated. There's no need for me to be Mechata. And I already took out the coals anyway, so that's what Bishamah says, you're allowed to. I will like Tavshul, but Bishamah says, no, a cooked food, you're not allowed to. Why? Because you might be Mechata, which the Mepharshim explained in Rashi, Shem Yechata, what do I mean? I took out the coals already. But... That's what we're saying, if there's going to be remnants or next time. But the point is that by a cooked food, it gets better as it stays over there. So therefore, he says, no, you're not allowed to do it, even if you did grufa ketuma. Or another reasoning that's brought for Bishami, Rashi says, is no, what's called mechzikim avashim. Ultimately, it looks like it's fulfilling his intention of cooking. It looks like he's cooking more than the, more than the water, because food, the more it cooks, the better it gets. So it looks like you're cooking. So to avoid that, Bishami says, no, for a cooked dish, you can't do, even if you did grufa ketuma, even if you did a blech. Now, they disagree. 
<laughs> which is that's how Allah is like that. No, they say Chaman Vitav shall know hot water and a cooked dish. You allowed to go ahead and leave on the fire. Now, that's one parameter regarding what type of food. Now, additionally, the Mishnah brings another machlekes b'shamay so. B'shamay, I mean, they say, okay, all you could do is you could leave it on what's called shahir. You could just leave it on from before Shabbos, and nightly you could take it off on Shabbos. But you can't put it back on fire on Shabbos because that's what's called mechzi kemavashal. That looks like you're cooking. Although you're not cooking, it's fully cooked, and there's a blech, doesn't make a difference. You're not allowed to put something back on Shabbos. Basilarim, they say, no, af machzin, you could even go ahead and put it back on Shabbos, because since there is grufa, you already shoveled out the coals, or you covered it with ashes, or like in our common day, you put on a blech, if there's a blech, then you could put it back on Shabbos. Now, Tesis says, what Basil says you could even put it back, is even on Shabbos you could put it back, as the Gemara explains this. And the reason how we know this, because when Bishamah says you're allowed to take it off, obviously he's talking about on Shabbos, because in a the weekday you don't have to tell me that you could take it off. But, but just Tracer points out, which is important, halacha he says, but the one who says it's forbidden to put it back on Shabbos would say it's actually even forbidden to put it back on Erev Shabbos. We are according to Basil, we'll see if, let's say, there's no blech, according to Bishami, even if there is a blech, but the ones who say it's going to be forbidden is going to be forbidden even on Erev Shabbos. And Tracer discusses how much time, the amount of time that if it, let's say, it's cold, or if it would have been cold, but even Erev Shabbos, and that has brought this opinion halacha, that... This hal- Isra of Chazar is not on Shabbos, it's actually on Arab Shabbos. It's just even on Shabbos. But Basil says, no, you're allowed to put it back if there's a blech, or you, did, you shovel without the cold, then you're allowed to put it back on. Now, the Gemara asks a very fundamental question, which is actually both opinions are brought even into the current halach, Lamaisa brought in the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah, which is a basic question, how to, how to translate our Mishnah. You better learn the following question. Hi, Yitin, we open up the, the, the parak, so you have an oven, that's heat up, if it's heat up with straw and stubble, so those, you're never going to be mechat. They're they flammable, they burn up right away, so that you can leave stuff on the stove from before Shabbos. But we said, if let's say things, they create coals, like let's say wood, so then we said, lo and you cannot put on, you cannot leave, you cannot put on something on the stove until you do, let's say, what's called a blech, or you take, shovel out the coals, or you cover it with ashes. This lo what does that mean you're not allowed to put on? Is it lo who? Is it saying that you're not allowed to put Back on Shabbos. Which, but when are you putting this on? It doesn't say when. So you're not allowed to put it on. Is that putting back on on Shabbos? Avalishois, but let's say to keep it on from before Shabbos. That mashin you could keep it on. Avapisha in the Gavain Katan. No, even if you didn't shovel out the cold, even if you didn't cover it with ashes, which that's what Katan is. That's where the word Katan gets introduced, where the Aramaic translation of Afer is Kitma. So, yeah, even if you didn't do that. It's, this is only Chazara that's permitted. Only Chazara, it's on Shabbos. Shabbos, okay. Only if it's Garva Katan, because Shabbos, you might come to Stoke and it's on Shabbos in Mexican Mabasha. But Erev Shabbos to leave it on? Yeah, it's permitted even if you don't. It's Erev Shabbos. Why not? Why can't you? Then it's permitted even if you didn't shovel out the cold, even if you didn't cover with ashes. Umani, and then who would be the Tana of our Mishnah? That would be Chanani. He would be going like Chanani, because the Tana of the and this is. Again, it's going to be a famous word we're going to hear throughout this of Hananiah. Hananiah, he says the following halacha. Kol shu kamaychel ben drisay. He says, if the food was cooked, at least the amount of how much ben drisay this bandit would eat it, which again, we explained there's a third of it's cooked, and we'll discuss this on later dafim. Mutter l'shay se al gabakir. says, you let it leave it on the oven. Afa pi shein the gar vein even though it's not shobadat, even it's not covered with ashes, the prohibition is only chazara. Erev Shabbos, I'm going to come to stoke the coals. Why, why am I, why? I'm going to do Isra Shabbos? If it wasn't cooked at all, and the guests are coming. So I'm, but it's already cooked, the third cook. People eat medium rear. People eat rear. People eat it. There's a third cook. Yeah, you're allowed to leave it on. We're not concerned you're going to come to stoke the coals. So therefore, therefore, if you're saying when it says that lo yiten is, you're not allowed to do chazara unless it's garfakatim, but the inference then would be she is permitted, oh, then the mission would be going like chananya. And actually, the Ramah brings down that that is the halacha lama'isa, that's the custom, like Hananya, that if it's already a third cook, you don't need a blech. You don't need to do garaf or katan. It's already a third cook. Are you going to come to cook it on Shabbos? Yeah, it's already edible. Oidim, or maybe, and actually, this opinion is also brought in halacha. The Shulchan Ach brings this down. The Mishnah brings down to be stringent like this opinion, too. Oidim, and but this is the other opinion, how to interpret the Mishnah. Maybe lisha is tanan. No, maybe when it says, you not let put it, it means you not let it even leave it on. And that's what the Mishnah is saying, we garva caught him in, if you shoveled out the cold, or if you covered it, then it's going to be permitted. But Eloi, if not, 
If you don't have a blech on from before Shabbos, what's called Shia, no, you're not allowed to leave it on. And Makosh can laugh, for sure, of course, Chazar, you're not allowed to do. That's the Gemara's question. What's the halacha of the Mishnah? Is it going like Hananya or like the Rabban of Hananya? Is it saying that you're not allowed to do Chazara, but Shia, you're allowed to do even without a Garfa Katan? Or is it even saying, no, Shia, you're not allowed to do, and for sure, Chazar, you're not allowed to do? So now the Gemara seeks to resolve this from the structure of our Mishnah. Toshima, let's bring it right. If you look at our Mishnah, you'll see that there's two different clauses in our Mishnah, which is, the Mishnah opens up, when it, after it told us the primary halacha, it says, I mean, they say, Okay, what could you do? This lo yitin, you can't do, unless garva katan. Oh, garva katan, you could do, you could place it. What could you? So Bishami say, Hot water, but not, not, uh, not a cooked dish. We still, I mean, they say, no, chaman v'tavshel, a hot water and a cooked dish. Then it says another case. They shamer and they say, on a case, a clause, they say, you could take, but you can't put it back on. But some they say, no, you could even put it back on. So it explains the Gemara. If you say, that the Mishnah was talking about when it opened up and said, you're not to place it on, was talking about that you're not allowed to leave it on, so this is what it would be saying. A oven that's heated up with straw, with stubble. Oh, so that mashna la tafsha. When it says yitin la that you can put on, you can leave on the cooked dish. But canvas of it if it's heated up with, with the refuse of the sesame seeds and of the wood, lo yisha. That's what lo yitin would mean. No, you're not allowed to leave it on. Until you shovel it out and you put on the ashes. And then that the Mishnah comes to qualify. It doesn't say these words, but that's what the mission is coming to tell us now, if you look at the structure of the Mishnah, um, and so what do you allow to leave on from before Shabbos, if you did garf or cotton, if you shoveled out the coals, or if you put on the ashes, Beishamiyam, they say, hot water, but not a cooked dish, Beishamiyam, they say, no, hot water and a cooked dish. Now, and that's what the second clause of the Mishnah comes to say, just like this is regarding what do you allow to leave on from before Shabbos, which we said is it hot water or, or a cooked dish. That we have another machlek is regarding putting back on what you allow to leave on from before Shabbos. For example, let's say hot water according to Bishamai and and chaman and tavshik according to Bishil. Now we have a machlek is regarding putting it back on on Shabbos. Shabbosham, they say, no, Nightland, what did I let you do? I let you leave it on from before Shabbos and to take it off. I'm not to put it back on. Ubisulam, they say, no, Abmachzim, you could even put it back on. So that makes sense reading in the Mishnah. But this is the problem. Eli Amen, but if you say, if you say like the first option of the Gemara that the Gemara wanted to say, let's say the Mishnah is like Hananya, that is talking about putting it back on. So obviously you have to explain the Mishnah like this. This is what the Mishnah is saying. Kirish is siku bekasha begevava, an oven that was heated up with straw and with stubble. So what does it mean when you say yitin alau? Like we said, noisim alau. You, you're explaining it means machzirin alau tapshel. You could put back on the cooked dish. Yeah, leaving on, you can leave on anything. Talking about putting back on. Begev is about eatsim, if it's with mark and with wood. So lo yach, so that you're not allowed to put back on. Actually, you give a sheet and eat until you shovel out the coals or you put on the ashes. And now that the Mishnah comes to explain the mahin magzirin again, because according to this interpretation, we're only talking about putting it back on. So that's what we're coming to say. Machlekes Bishamim says, "What are you allowed to put back on?" Bishamim, they say, "Chaman nabolay tavshul." What are you allowed to put back on? Shabbos only the hot water kettle, but not a cooked dish of pot of chal. Ubisalam, they say, "No, chaman v'tavshul." You could put back on the hot water and the cooked dish. So how do you read the next line of the Mishnah? Bishamim, so the Bishamim say, "Noit nabolay magzirin." Oh, you could take off. But you can't put back on, which obviously the way we're interpreting the mission is going on the cooked dish. Because they say you're allowed to do chazara on the hot water because the whole mission is only doma chazara. It'll be silam. And they say, no, you can even put it back on. Why do you need that? You already said that's the halacha the reisha. We know Bishami said, for example, avaloi tavshel. Because that was, they were, their machlegs were regarding chazara. So what are you saying over here in the, in the Mishnah? Obviously, then we have to say that the Mishnah was told much shihiyah. And therefore, we're saying, but Shehi, you need Gufa Ketumah. And then we say a different Machlech, you're going to Chazara. That's so obviously our mission is not like Hananya. And that we don't permit Shehi without a Blech, when it's just a third cook. It has to be, let's say, fully cooked. So the Gemara rejects this proof. as a tin type of Lamadzai and Manalf. That actually, truthfully, I could tell you that That yes, the Mishnah was only discussing regarding... Are you allowed to put it back on Shabbos? Because regarding what's called Shehiyah, leaving on from before Shabbos, even if the coals were not shoveled out, it's going to be permitted because it's going like Hananya. 
But Chesur Mechzer, and there are words missing from the Mishnah, which Tosis wonders. We generally only say words are missing from the Mishnah to answer a very difficult question. Here we have no difficulty. We're just proving who is the town of the Mishnah. So Tosis says, because we rule a Kananya, which Tosis is going to explain that on Amid Beis, on Lam Zayim Beis, so therefore the Gemara goes through a contrived interpretation of the Mishnah to establish that the Allah of the Mishnah is going like Kananya. Although we, we could read it very simply, that it's obviously like the Rabbanan. No, the Gemara is going to say that word's missing. And this is the way you have to read the Mishnah, which is, Read it like this. An oven that was heated up with straw and stubble. Yes, when we say, it means putting back on. Not for me, for sure. Putting back on the cook dish. But if it's like with mark and with wood, you're not allowed to put back on. Actually, until you shovel out the coals, or you treat it as ephem, or you put on ash again, like we're concerned, if you're putting back on Shabbos and cool off a little bit, you might come to stoke the coals when you're putting back on, you know, Put it better back on a little bit higher. So if we say no, then you're not allowed to put it put it back on until like say you had a blech that it's going to remind you and that you're not going to go to do that. Now these are the words that are not here in the Mishnah. Avalishes, but to do shia, yeah, mashin. You're allowed to do. Avabisha in the garv in the cotton. No, even if it's not shoveled out, even if it's not covered with ashes, because the machlek is only regarding chazara. Shia from before shabbos, yeah, that we're okay with because it's like chananya. He says, as long as we're a third cook, we're not concerned you're going to come to cook it. You leave it off from before Shabbos. What's the big deal? People eat it like that. Now, umahin, mashin, but this is what the next words in the Mishnah are going on. It's not going on the beginning of the race of the Mishnah, which is Toma Chazar. It's talking about this that we said, you let it do Shia. What do you let it leave on from before Shabbos? And these are the words we have in the Mishnah. Bishamim, they say, Chaman Abaloi Tavshal, only hot water, but not a cooked dish. Bishalim, they say, Chaman Abaloi hot water and a cooked dish. Now, but see, this is why it's a little convoluted, but the Mishnah, the, like the Taish said, we want to say it because the Allah is like Hananya. Now we're going back to the beginning of the Mishnah. V'ha chazar damer, like this I said to you in the beginning of the Mishnah, that you're not allowed to put things back on until you shovel it, but the inference is, if you did shovel out the coals, what we call a blech, it's going to be permitted, lav de That's not going according to everyone, because Bishamah does not hold of that. El the machlekis Bishamah sil, that's a machlekis Bishamah sil. And those words are not there, but the following words are here. Because Bishamay say, and you can only leave on to take off, and you cannot put back on. You could even put it back on, and therefore, like we said, the, really the third section informs us that it reflects the opinion of Bishil only. So it's not really, a, the question was, it's redundant. If you're saying that Rish is about Chazara, so why are you saying again Chazara? So we said, obviously, Rish is Shahia that you can't do, and the Savior is to Tomat Chazara. On that we say, no, really, the Mishnah is only telling you you cannot do Chazar. Because she, you could do like, 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 like Hananya, and we, therefore we have not yet resolved the question. We cannot prove that it's not like Hananya, because we could interpret the Mishnah if we say Chazur Mechzer, like Hananya too. And the Sefer was just coming to qualify this that I said to you in the beginning of the Mishnah, that, what, that you could do Chazar if you have Gruva Ketumah. That's not according to everyone, because Bishama says you cannot do Chazar even Gruva Ketumah, you can only do Shia, and that halacha that we said you could do Chazar if this Gruva Ketumah with a blach was going only according to Bishal. Something that we spoke about in this daf on Shabbos, daf Lamed Vav, was a continuation of the previous daf, which had spoken about the halacha of the six shafer blasts on Arab Shabbos, which we said after the last one, that's it, no malacha, you can't light the candle anymore. So he said, I, what's with the chazan that he has to, he takes it home. He says, no, he doesn't take it home, he has to drop the shafer over there in a the discreet place, because the you not let him move on Shabbos, not a shafer, not a chatzetzes. We asked, hey, hey, I have a price that says, you let him move a shafer, just not a chatzetzes. And I said, wait a second, we have another price that says, actually you, can, you can't move, that you could move a shafer and a chatzetzes. So the Gemara says yes, because these are three Tanoic opinions, and that's all these three brises. The brisa that says that you're allowed to move a shayfer, but not a trumpet, that's going like a Yehuda. Because a shayfer is a kli. It's a kli, shemalachtoi laheter. It's used for permissible things, for drinking for a child. So therefore, you're allowed to move it because it's a kli. Oh, a trumpet... You can't drink from it, so therefore it's it's a, it's mukta because, like we said, it's a kli shemalachte. What's its primary use? Is leiser. It's used for something prohibited, which you're not allowed to use instruments on Shabbos. So therefore, that's going to be mukta. The the second bright the bright that says that, which was actually the third one quoted, that both are mutter. That's going like Reb Shimon, who like the Gemara calls it less lay mukta. It doesn't really hold valach as a mukta. And Mechemi said that actually he's the bride that says both of them are usser, because he holds even a talus, even a knife, could only be used for its designated utility. 
and therefore, obviously, a shave is not usually used for drinking water, and therefore, even that's going to be mukta. Then we said that there are five things. We started with three, we had another one, then we had another one. There are five things that the names were changed, where what was once a trumpet was called, is now called shafer, was called a shafer, is now called a trumpet. The nafkamin is obviously Rosh Hashanah, they have to blow specifically that of a shafer, which today you're going to use a chatzaitzis, because that's the name of the shafer. The araba and the tzavtzafa were changed, which enough means for the lulav, which you have to use specific araba. So you're going to use the current tzavtzafa, which is really what the araba is. Pesarim, pesarita, a large table and a small one. Enough means for business, obviously, when you're ordering something, what you're getting. Huvlila and the bekasi, as we had the picture of the animal, which are the, the second and the third stomachs of the ruminant, which the order was changed, and therefore the enough means the like we said, if there's a needle through one of the stomachs, that would be only one of them kosher, the other one would be trefa. And also we said bubble and borsub, the names would change also. And enough means legitinash, we had two interpretations, either because in bubble they don't have to say befane nechtab u befane nechtam, which now that's borsub, and borsub is really bubble, or it's because simply by a get you have to write the right name of the city. If not, it's not going to be valid. Hadnilach, we, 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 we concluded perik bremen and we started the third perik, perik kiru, which as we said speaks about the laws of Bishal and the rabbinic Shehiya and Chazara about the concern about leaving it on and returning it on Shabbos. So we said that Akira, which again we said there's three types of ovens we're going to speak about, it's a, a double oven, that's square, that was heated up if it's with straw and stubble, so that's not stuff that you could, that are, because they're very flammable, so they're, they're not like coals, so then you could be nice to them, and the reason why we put in parentheses in a quotes because that's the machlekes, that's the, the debate in the Gemara which are going to go on for the next daf, and what, is, what does it mean? But you could put, you could put on the tafshel. Now, with gefes beitzim, which those are things that like make coals, so then you need gruf because we're concerned, like Rashi says, shem you might come to stoke the coals. So therefore, it needs a blech, let's say. It needs to shovel out the coals or to cover it with ashes. Now, in the Mishnah, was two machlekes b'sham b'sil. Is it when we permit you to put on only, like b'sham says, only chamen? Or is it like b'sil, even a cooked dish? Additionally, is it only that we permit you, like b'sham says, to take it off, which is what would be called shahia? Or is it like b'sil says, even chazara, even that would be permitted, if you have a group of ketuma, if you have what we call, what we use, is a blech. Now, a very fundamental question, how to translate the Mishnah, the Gemara asked Ibailu. When it says, lo yiten, you cannot put on, let's say when it's with wood, which is coals, that you cannot put on the food unless it's garf or katim, unless you have a blech, unless you took out the, 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 you shoveled it out, or you covered ashes. What do we mean you can't put on? What does yiten mean? Is that shahiya? That you can't even leave on from before Shabbos, which is what we call the Rabbanan? meaning versus that of Hananya. And, of course, Chazara you can't do without a blech. Or is it saying, no, you can't do Chazara, you can't return it. But that would infer, but Shehiyah is mutter, that would be like Hananya, who he says, no, even if it's not fully cooked, as long as it's just a third of it being cooked, you could leave it on without a blech. That was the Gemara's question. So the Gemara attempted to prove, and the Gemara says, no, it's not a proof from the fact that we have two different clauses in the Mishnah, because you could say that it's chesuri mechsra, because ultimately it sounded like that it has to be shehiyah ben chazar, because as we said, when we read the Mishnah, they were talking about lo yitin. then there was another machlekes of regarding, are you allowed to do chazara? But if the opening halacha is chazara, so then what are you saying again, chazara? So it's, like, no, it's not a raya, because this word's missing, and the, 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 the isra is only by chazara. But, the end of the mission is coming to tell you that who is it who permits Chazara with Gruf that that is Basil because Beishamai is disagreeing. That's what the Sefer is coming to qualify. But really, the Reisha also was only talking about Chazara. But really, Shehiyah is permitted even without a Gruf which is like Hananya, which again, like the Taisis brings down, the Ramah brings down, that one could be lenient as long as it's a third cooked, that then you could leave it on with what we call without a blech. You don't need grufik tumah. That is the possibility, and the B'dikma has not yet resolved the halacha of our Mishnah or the halacha of based on our Mishnah, because it could be both like Drabban or like Hananiah, thinking to any time of hosting us.